He says to him, yo, I'm going to tell you something, but you can't tell nobody. The guy's like, all right, tell me. So he tells him what Atika saw in her dream. 24 hours later, the whole city knows about it. Everybody's talking. When the news reached Abu Jahl, he came up to Abbas and said, Abbas, you guys told us that the men among you get messages from the sky, but you never told us that your women also are divinely inspired. Abbas was speechless. How the heck did Abu Jahl find out? So much for secrets, eh? So Abu Jahl tells Abbas, I swear, if in three days there is no evidence to Atika's claim, then we're going to hang up a statement in the Kaaba that says, your family is the biggest bunch of liars amongst the Arabs. Three days later, the battle of Badr takes place. Now Abbas didn't want to take part in the battle. He didn't want to fight against his nephew. They both loved each other. In fact, Abbas used to send letters to the Prophet, peace be upon him, telling him about Quraysh and their plans and stuff. But the Prophet used to hide this from everybody. Because if this secret had the same fate as the previous one, and the news reached Quraysh, then an Abbas would be in deep trouble. So Abbas didn't want to fight. But Quraysh forced him to go out with them in order to see where his loyalty was. Before the battle starts, the Prophet, peace be upon him, made an important announcement to his army. He said, Whoever sees an Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib in battle, spare his life. Don't kill him, for he has been forced to take part in it. So a companion by the name of Abu Hudayfa ibn Utbah said, You want us to go out and kill our disbelieving fathers and brothers? And you want us to spare Al-Abbas? If I see Al-Abbas in battle, then I swear to God I'm going to kill him. We're human people, and sometimes we make mistakes. And Abu Hudayfa made a mistake. He doesn't know that Al-Abbas was helping the Muslims out by sending news to the Prophet. This guy was forced to fight us, and he's also stood by us. It's not right to kill him. By the way, Abu Hudayfa felt real bad for having said this to the Prophet. And he said later on, I swear. I think the only thing I can do to make up for what I told the Prophet that day is to die a martyr. Only then will I feel at peace with myself. And Abu Hudayfa died a martyr during the Battle of Yamana. God bless his soul. So the battle starts and Al-Abbas is just standing there in the middle of the fight. And eventually he's captured and taken as prisoner. So he's put along with the other prisoners. And you'd assume that the Prophet, peace be upon him, would let him go free. He's the Prophet's uncle for God's sake. But the Prophet can't release him. He can't let him or any other prisoner go without the permission of the companions. Huh? Yep. There's no such thing as connections. There's no such thing as special privileges for some. There's nothing like, yo, I'm the Prophet's neighbor so I get to move to the front of the line. No wastas. That's a deep meaning for us brothers and sisters. So he's put with the prisoners and it seems that the guy who ties up the prisoners tied Al-Abbas up real good. Probably because Al-Abbas was massive and they feared he may escape. It said that that night, the Prophet, peace be upon him, couldn't get any sleep. So the companions asked him, Why aren't you sleeping, O Prophet of God? The Prophet said, I can't. I can hear Al-Abbas moaning out of pain because the rope's been tied too tightly. The Prophet was at a distance from the prisoners, but he could feel Al-Abbas's pain. The Prophet's unbelievably merciful, peace be upon him. He's so in touch with his compassionate side. So one of the companions got up, went over to the prisoners, and found that Al-Abbas's ropes were indeed tight, and that he was in pain. So he loosened them up a bit, and the Prophet asked, well, Why can't I hear Al-Abbas moaning anymore? So the companion said, I loosened the ropes up, O Prophet of God. So the Prophet said, Did you do that with the rest of the prisoners? The companion said, No. So the Prophet told him, Go back and do the same for everybody. Equality, people. Equality. Now the third story has to do with the conquest of Mecca. If you remember from previous episodes, we talked about the Hudaybiyah treaty that was signed between the Prophet, peace be upon him, and Quraysh, which established 10 years of peace between the two sides. Now Quraysh violated the treaty by breaking some of the terms that they had agreed to. What terms did they break? They killed some Muslims. So in response, the Prophet, peace be upon him, assembled an army of 10,000 people, and they headed to Mecca. The Prophet's a smart man. He didn't want Quraysh to think that he was heading for them. Why? Because the Prophet wanted to enter Mecca peacefully. If Quraysh knew that the Prophet was coming, they would get ready for battle and there would be a war for sure. So to avoid bloodshed, he had the army set out in a direction other than that which they normally take to Mecca. Any spy on the road would have no clue that the destination was Mecca because they weren't heading in that direction. 
Once they were close enough though, the Prophet peace be upon him suddenly switched directions and the army was soon at the outskirts of Mecca. The Prophet peace be upon him surrounded the city and Quraysh was taken by surprise. Guy, the Prophet is unreal. Everything he does is just brilliant. Now guess who left Mecca at this point as an immigrant to Medina? Al-Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib. That's it. I want to live in the company of the Prophet, peace be upon him. And he didn't have to ride for long before seeing the Muslim army surrounding the city. Well, what are you doing, Abbas? I'm immigrating to Medina. The Prophet said to him, My dear uncle, God will that I be the seal of the Prophets, and that you be the last of the immigrants to Medina. The Prophet was overjoyed with Al-Abbas. He got the blessings for being the last immigrant at the last minute. If he waited two more hours, he wouldn't have been as lucky. He wouldn't have reaped the good deeds for leaving his home to be with the Prophet and the Muslims. Mm, bro, don't put stuff off that you know you got to do. Prayers, a cat, you know what I'm talking about. Because you never know, death may come knocking on your door any minute and you won't be able to make up for your tardiness. Same goes for you, sister. You don't want to be late. Al-Abbas took those steps a couple of hours before it was too late. So after Al-Abbas met the Prophet, peace be upon him, he said to him, O Prophet of God, let me go back towards Mecca and try to meet up with somebody from Quraysh so that I can tell them that they got no chance against the Muslim army. Maybe I can convince them to surrender peacefully so that there's no bloodshed. So the Prophet agrees to Al-Abbas's proposal and he tells him to take his mule. You see people, our aim should always be to avoid bloodshed. That is the way of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Whoever thinks otherwise should go back to the books and read up on the life of this great messenger, because you probably missed a couple of hundred chapters. So Al-Abbas rides towards Mecca in the middle of the night on the Prophet's mule, and guess who he finds on the way? Abu Sufyan, the leader of Quraysh. Now the Prophet, peace be upon him, had asked the whole army to light up fire. So when Abu Sufyan saw this from a distance, he was like, what the heck is that? Who are those people? Thousands upon thousands. So Abbas told him that it was the Prophet of God with 10,000 warriors. He told Abu Sufyan, look man, he's got 10,000. You don't stand a chance. Do Quraysh a favor and accept Islam. Abu Sufyan is like, I can't. There's a long history of violence between me and the Prophet. I've wronged him so much. He'll have me killed. Al Abbas said, Don't worry, I'll guarantee your protection. So Abu Sufyan accepted, and they both got on the Prophet's mule and returned to the Muslim camps. As they reached the camps, Umar ibn Khattab lays eyes on Abu Sufyan. Don't forget, people, there's 20 years of oppression against the Muslims, and Abu Sufyan was one of the main drivers of this cruelty. So Umar says, Abu Sufyan? The enemy of God? Omar wanted Abu Sufyan's head. But Abbas told Omar that he's under his protection. Omar's like, no way! This guy has no protection today! After all that he's done? So Abbas says, hold on Omar. The only reason you're doing this is because he's not from your clan. Sayyidina Omar goes quiet for a while. And then he says, Abbas, I swear to God, your conversion to Islam brought more happiness to my heart than the happiness I would have felt if my own father, Al-Khattab, converted to Islam. Because I know that your conversion pleases the Prophet of God more than that of my dad's. I'm almost telling him, you think it's about families? I was overjoyed with your conversion. How can you say that to me, Abbas? So Abu Sufyan enters to meet the Prophet, peace be upon him, and the Prophet says to him, Isn't it about time, Abu Sufyan? that you bear witness that there is no God but Allah? Abu Sufyan says, Yes. If these idols that we worship were truly gods, they would have helped us today. I bear witness that there is no God except Allah. So the Prophet continues, And isn't it about time that you bear witness that I am the messenger of God? Abu Sufyan says, As for this, there is some doubt in my heart.